Welcome Martin, it's such a pleasure to have you here with us today. You've got over 30 years experience fighting financial crime and today we're going to be talking about tipping off. Noel, it's my pleasure to be here talking about a subject I'm very, very passionate about. So Martin, tipping off is a real grey area for many employees. If we have a concern about a customer and we need more information from them, then we may be fearful that speaking directly to them could risk us revealing our concerns to a potentially criminal customer and consequently tip them off that they're under investigation. Could you just clarify for us what behaviour actually qualifies as tipping off? Well, this is why we're here. It is a subject that's been misunderstood. But let's put it bluntly out there. You cannot inadvertently, accidentally or consequently commit the offence of tipping off. There needs to be a deliberate act undertaken with an intent to alert a customer, a third party, to an investigation or the filing of a SAR or to prevent and frustrate a criminal investigation into money laundering. So if we can't be guilty of tipping off without deliberately intending to assist a criminal, then why is there so much confusion? People are overthinking it, Nola. No laws are designed to trip you up or to, in some ways, intimidate you or frustrate you. There are times when we can, and therefore we should, talk to customers to secure important information about concerns or suspicions. So who should request information from a customer? That would be the people who normally talk to customers. That would be the relationship managers. And at which points should they be speaking to customers? Well, there are different points in this, but when we are opening an account for a new customer, a new relationship, we can tell them that we require certain information and documentation to comply with anti money laundering laws and regulations. After all, that's what we're doing. And the same applies when we're undertaking a periodic review of the Know Your Customer Information documentation for an existing customer. OK, so what about unusual transactions with an existing customer? This is different, OK, but there's a sequence to the owner. If you are suspicious, you file that suspicious activity report. That's the law, what's, what's demanded of you. But very often, between the unusual transaction and the filing of the SAR, there's a period where you're concerned. And in that period, you can talk to the customer. Indeed, sometimes it's important to do so, because the customer may give you information that causes the concern to evaporate and go away, or actually causes suspicion to crystallise. So, it's not an offence of tipping off. It is collecting important information which may benefit the legitimate customer. And in that window when we're concerned, we're not suspicious, but we do need that important information from the customer so we can ask. So what happens if the customer challenges the request from the relationship manager? We need to tell them they're collecting important risk information. Something's happened, it's unusual, we don't know what it is, we need more information from the customer to identify and manage risks. OK, so that's all well and good in theory. But what happens if a customer asks, is this about money laundering? All right, that's a very important point, and it could happen. And it's a job of the AML professional to equip and train the relationship banker, relationship manager, to answer that question without fear of being compromised. And I would advise everybody that your policy should have a, a line similar to, it is a policy of this bank never to answer questions about money laundering, Nola. So that's the answer you give. And we only ask questions about money laundering when we're opening an account or undertaking a periodic review. OK, so what's the compliance team's role here? Well, concerns about transactions should be controlled by the AML professional, as should communications about those transactions. We are the experts. We can look at something and cause concerns to disappear. We can make a call. We should make a call. But we don't want people to jeopardise investigations, so we control the conversations. We need to train and protect relationship bankers to ensure that criminals don't compromise them. But we can talk to customers. And indeed, for legitimate customers, we should talk to them to elicit from them logical explanations for unusual transactions and avoid finding unnecessary SARs. So can an AML specialist speak to a customer? Yes, he or she can, but they should introduce themselves as somebody from the risk department within the firm or the bank. Ultimately, that's who we all work for and money laundering is one of those risks that's managed. So don't tell them you work for the money laundering department, but most importantly, never lie to a customer. It's bad practice. So some criminals can be very charming and persuasive, 
How do we empower relationship managers to handle these sensitive conversations? You write about these criminals, Nola. I've met many la money launderers. I've never met a money launderer that was not a nice person. But that's why we train our staff. That's why it's so important. We want to give them the capability and the confidence to deal with the customer and to protect themselves and push back against criminals who might seek to compromise them. So if we reach the point where a suspicious activity report has been filed, can we close an account without being guilty of tipping off? Yes, we can. And there are times when we should. In my case, there are times when I've done it many times. I've been to court for it and the court has always backed me. I've never been charged with tipping off for doing so. It's not an offence of tipping off because if as a consequence the, cr the criminal customer works out that we work that it's money laundering, so be it. Moreover, the penalty for tipping off is two years imprisonment. The penalties for money laundering is 14. You do the math, as the Americans would say. If we keep the account open, we may be facilitating money laundering. We're certainly going to retain a higher level of risk that requires more due diligence, more transaction monitoring, and actually it may mean that we're laundering money. So filing the SAR is not the end of it, Sometimes it's the beginning of an issue, but in 2021, we should move from reporting and gathering intelligence to reporting suspicions of money laundering and then stopping money laundering in order to save lives. Ultimately, that's what we do. So why do people keep accounts open? One reason why we're here for this training to actually stop them doing so. There's a misunderstanding. They sometimes wait for law enforcement to come back to them, which isn't gonna happen because law enforcement are looking at hundreds of thousands or millions of specific SARS suspicious activity reports. Also, some people think that the police want the account to remain open so they can follow the money. That's abject nonsense, it doesn't happen because the police can't underwrite the position most of the time. If you keep an account open, you run the risk of laundering money and it is our role to stop money laundering. So don't wait for the police, take action. Money laundering is not to spectator sport. Don't watch it happening, stop it happening. Also, if we have a suspicious transaction, can we reject that? Yes, we can. And, and the authorities say to us sometimes, you don't have to complete transactions. Importantly, the criminal law will always take primacy over the contract law. And all this reminds me you know, of instances when I've been in a court and the judge has said, I cannot and I will not instruct Mr. Woods to undertake a course of action that may mean he's committing a criminal offence. So you can block transactions, you can close accounts, and it's not tipping off. So in conclusion, the anti-money laundering team need to be up to speed and they must support the frontline employees as well. Absolutely, that's what the training's for. We hope this training is helping people looking in right now and listening. It reminds me many years ago of a story that went around London and let me give it to you. The CFO said to the CEO, what happens if we train our staff and they leave? To which the CEO replied, what happens if we don't train our staff and they stay? Ergo, it's all about training. Martin, thank you so much for joining us. We hope to speak with you again soon about other topics affecting the compliance industry. And thank you so much for tolerating me. Thank you.